Thanks very much, Rika, and hello to everybody. It's it's really cool to see all of the people behind us today. So as Rika said, I'm Nadia Sitas. I'm based at the Center for Complex Systems and Transition in Stellenbosch at Stellenbosch University. Um, and I'm linked to the USAID-funded Resilient Waters Project, which is focusing um, their activities in enhancing the resilience of the Okavango and Limpopo river basins, um, together with a whole lot of different um, institutions and role players. Um, and yeah, a lot of my research focuses on trying to think about um, building resilience um, within different um, landscapes, uh, with a strong focus on thinking about issues related to equity and gender. Um, and I think one thing that's been really interesting um, to think about has been, you know, what are the impacts of, of any kind of change? And we've just seen major disruption now with the pandemic um, in terms of how this impacts our, our daily lives, but also the spaces that we work that we work on and the people that we work with. So, um, yeah, welcome, everybody. We've got two lovely uh, panelists today um, and I'll let them introduce themselves shortly. Um, so I think we're going to start with uh, Hayley Clements. So over to you, Hayley. Thanks, Nadia, and good afternoon, everybody. I'm very pleased to be having this conversation with you all. Um, so as Nadia says, I'm Hayley Clements, and I'm a researcher at the same centre, the Centre for Complex Systems in Transition uh, in Stellenbosch. And I, I'm never really sure how to label myself. Uh, so these days I go with interdisciplinary conservation scientist. And uh, by interdisciplinary, what I mean is that I do research that looks at the people and economic aspects of conservation, as well as the ecological aspects and, and how they interact. And how I landed up in this space is that after an undergraduate degree in ecology, uh, I was employed by a private game reserve in South Africa. And that really gave me insight into the practice of running a game reserve and uh, in particular, the extent to which things like owner motivations, cash flow challenges, tourist demands, economic recessions, etc., really shape conservation. And I realized that my understanding uh, of ecology would only take me so far. And so I did a PhD uh, aimed at understanding conservation efforts on private land in South Africa, uh, focused on these more socioeconomic drivers. And, and that enabled me to go on a big road trip around the Cape uh, of South Africa, where I interviewed 75 landowners uh, and managers of private reserves. And so that is still a strong uh, research focus of mine. And I have students that work on that now. Uh, but I've also started two new projects this year, uh, which have kind of broadened my conceptual and geographic uh, reach somewhat. So the first of those projects uh, is looking at sustainable use and in particular, the controversial practice of uh, trophy hunting, uh, researching its role in conservation as well as livelihoods and economies in Southern Africa. And that's uh, also in affiliation with the University of Helsinki. And then the second project, which is my primary focus right now, is uh, aimed at developing a index of biodiversity intactness or ecosystem condition uh, for the African continent, and then exploring the many ways in which uh, ecosystem condi condition links uh, to human well-being. So I'll leave it at that for an inter introduction. Thanks very much, um, Haley. Yeah, take it away, Steve. Um, hi, uh, good afternoon, everybody. <clears throat> if you're um, in our part of the world, you're in the afternoon now. I see someone from New York. It's still the morning. Um, so my name is Steve Collins. I see there's another Steve Collins on the, <laughs> the webinar. I don't know who that is. Um, so um, I um, would call myself a rural development facilitator. Um, I've been working in the field of conservation and human rights, literally, I, I suppose, since 1995, when I was involved in the St. Lucia mining uh, process that the new government, the ANC government then had to make a decision on and we ran a process which really focused on what I think is still the way I look at these things is what is the impact on local people, what's the impact on a local economy of what essentially is a land choice decision. When you when you choose a protected area, you are excluding other other land uses, you are say you're involved in tourism, etc. Um, so I've um, I've worked a lot with communities in setting up community conservation areas uh, for them to manage their own land. 
Um, I, I, it, I suppose sitting here, I'm, I'm wearing two hats. Uh, one would be um, a CEO of the African Safari Foundation. We're an organization which has facilitated fair deals between communities with rights in South Africa where they've reclaimed land or in places like Namibia where they've been given rights and between those community structures and private sector operators. Um, we, um, so we've been doing that since 2003. Um, really, it's been quite a while. Um, and then um, I'm currently also the Livelihoods and Adaptation Advisor for the Resilient Waters Program, the USAID program. It's a SADC-wide program dealing with both the uh, Okavango and Limpopo River basins, but then also the transfrontier conservation areas. And it's it's got a focus on uh, wash, water, sanitation, and health, but then also livelihoods and how they are impacted on by climate change, but also how those communities that are very reliant on natural resources um, are how we can help them develop in a way which doesn't compromise the natural resource. And tourism, which we were talking about later, has been one of, what certainly was one of the focuses. I think we're all re having to rethink about how um, how communities can benefit from the natural resource going forward. Super. Thanks. Thanks very much. Um, and it's it's wonderful to see we've got 99 attendees now. I think we're almost reaching capacity. But just to say, we are recording this. Um, so if there are some disappointed friends that you have, we will be sharing this. Um, yeah, so I think it would be great to just hear a bit more from, from both of our, our speakers. Um, if you could give us a bit more of an overview um, of your work as it links to kind of building resilience and reflecting on what this pandemic means for, for the types of places um, and people that you, that you work with and the places you work in. Um, so I think we can start with you again, Hayley. Okay, so just to say up front that I am going to speak quite specifically about the South African wildlife economy, which is what I know better. Um, while Steve will then uh, broaden the discussion beyond South Africa, given his considerable experience in other Southern African countries as well. And of course, there are many similarities, but also some important differences. And maybe that's a, a point for discussion. So before I reflect on what the pandemic may mean for the wildlife economy, uh, for those uh, that have joined us today that are less familiar uh, with this economy in, in South Africa, I'm going to first talk a bit about who the players are and how they participate, uh, which are dimensions that I think are important uh, when we think about the resilience of the wildlife economy. In other words, we need to think about resilience in terms of the of what, to what, and for whom uh, components. So, so most people are likely to be familiar with national parks, uh, which are the more conventional form of, of conservation in which the state is responsible. In South Africa, we have 20 national parks, as well as many provincial and local nature reserves. And the government provides these reserves with funding towards their running costs. But over the years, parks have also been expected to cover an increasing portion of their running costs through ecotourism. So essentially, we've been seeing a transition from the perspective that it's the responsibility of the state uh, to, to pay for conservation to the notion that conservation can and should uh, pay for itself. So I just was looking today at the 2019 South African National Parks Annual Report, which tells us that these parks generated last year 2.2 billion in tourism revenues, and they received 0.7 billion in government funding. So that gives you a sense uh, of the extent to which they depend on tourism revenues. And what's also interesting is that uh, just five out of our 20 national parks, uh, the most well-known being the Kruger, generate a surplus uh, of revenue through tourism, which then goes towards uh, the running costs of other parks, uh, which may be less able to draw crowds of tourists, but that may still conserve important ecosystems and species. There is also a growing recognition that parks need to benefit the people that live around them and that typically bear the costs of living with wildlife, but often not the benefits. 
And the parks that run successful tourism operations are able to employ far more people and also upskill them than those that do not. Uh, and these operations in turn have considerable economic spillovers into local economies through supply chains that service both the park and its tourists. Uh, so many of our parks are in rural areas where, the, where this economic footprint can be significant. Some parks also have community partnerships, particularly where there's been a successful land claim, which typically entails a benefit sharing uh, agreement, uh, which also is mostly centered on ecotourism. So in addition to these state reserves, there's also a strong involvement of private landowners in the wildlife economy in South Africa, which is what has been my focus. And, and to put this in perspective, state protected areas cover around 8% of South Africa's land area, while private game and nature reserves cover an estimated 17, 17%. So that's double the area of land supporting wildlife that's owned privately compared with state land. Now, this involvement of private landowners in the wildlife economy can be attributed in part or in a large part to policy changes in the last century, which devolved wildlife ownership rights to landowners. So I'm not sure if many people have thought about who owns wildlife, uh, but it can actually be really important. So in many countries, wildlife are owned by the state, which means that individual landowners or communities have very little incentive to conserve them. By contrast, because Southern Africa has a lot of potential to attract visitors to see or hunt its exceptional wildlife, allowing landowners to own wildlife meant that they could build livelihoods around it, uh, particularly in the more arid regions of South Africa that aren't so appropriate for farming. Now, these private reserves uh, have relatively a relatively diverse portfolio of revenue streams, including ecotourism, as well as trophy hunting, primarily by foreigners, meat hunting by locals, live wildlife trade, as well as some landowners that still do farming, uh, generally livestock or, for, or small stock farming. Now, just to quickly flag the wildlife trade is important. Uh, because wildlife have value for the ecotourism and hunting purposes, money can be made from trading them, uh, the buying and selling of live animals. And we have a student at the moment who's done a, a network analysis which shows considerable trade between state and private reserves uh, with the private sector thus providing additional revenue streams to state parks through, through wildlife trade. Uh, in addition to that, private reserves that adjoin national parks, such as those around Kruger, have also been shown to disproportionately increase the number of people that are employed and also the revenues that are generated, thereby increasing the, the economic footprint of those parks. Now, when talking about private landowners uh, involved in the wildlife economy, it's also important to note that Following the general uh, inequitable distribution of land in South Africa, the demographic profile of uh, private wildlife uh, landowners is typically white with both local and foreign owners. Uh, the government has a strong focus at the moment on what it calls the biodiversity economy strategy of which uh, the wildlife economy is, a, is, a, is part of that, which really recognizes its role that it could play in, in rural development. And that has a strong focus on transformation in the sector. And that is, is slowly starting. But um, my research from the Cape region of South Africa also shows that private game reserves are expensive to start. In many cases, very expensive and also to run. And only 60% of those that I interviewed were actually profitable. So that presents challenges for transformation. And among existing owners, they are therefore some that participate as a hobby or a side project and are typically less dependent uh, on the reserve paying its own way. Uh, our president in South Africa falls in that category, as do many foreign owners and businessmen. Whereas for others, it's their livelihood, uh, their primary or even sole source of income. So, the state and private landowners and their employees 
and in some cases in partnership with local communities, are really the players in the South African wildlife economy. And to emphasize across both state and private reserves, the, the wildlife economy is as much about local livelihoods and rural economies as it is about conservation. And that's largely enabled by ecotourism and to a smaller degree wildlife trade and in the private sector also by hunting. Now, the pandemic is not the first shock to those revenue streams that the wildlife economy has had to endure. It went through a global and then a local recession in re recent times, but its resilience has never been tested to a shock quite so severe. So a key principle is that diversity builds resilience because diverse elements of a system are likely to respond differently to a disturbance. So in eco ecological systems, for example, if species that provide the same ecosystem function respond differently to a disturbance, then there's the likelihood that some species will persist uh, and thus ecosystem function will be maintained. So in the wildlife economy, or we could say in South Africa's conservation system, as I've described, we see diversity both in terms of who participates and how they participate. So notably, we may expect that state reserves will be more resilient because they receive state funding and can shift resources between parks. However, even state parks uh, are incredibly reliant on tourism revenues, and the state now has even more demands on its resources, questioning its allocation to conservation going forward. By contrast, private reserves typically don't receive state funding, and they operate as individual entities, which may, may mean they're more vulnerable. That said, some landowners are not dependent on their wildlife ranches for their livelihoods, and they and their employees are likely to be in a better position right now than landowners that don't have other incomes. Many landowners are, are likely to be forced to seek alternative land use options if they can. And a student of ours recently interviewed private landowners to ask what they would do in the event that there was a trophy hunting ban which has given increasing global pressure to stop uh, the practice on ethical grounds. And so this can give us some insight into how these landowners might uh, respond now in the absence of not just trophy hunting revenue, but any revenue. And a third of landowners in that study said that they would scale up or transition to ecotourism, which of course is now not an option. While a third said that they would transition back to livestock farming and the remainder said that they honestly didn't know what they would do because the land wasn't suitable for any other land use. Research has also shown that wildlife-based land uses on average employ more people and at higher salaries than farming, particularly in marginal areas uh, and particularly high-end ecotourism reserves. So the pandemic is likely to have significant short and longer term impacts on both livelihoods and conservation. Now, bringing this back to the notion of diversity, because of the diversity of, of players and possible response strategies, some reserves will have greater capacity than others to adapt with a range of implications, both for, for livelihoods and for conservation. Now, diversity is also important in terms of revenue streams. Ecotourism, hunting and wildlife trade may seem diverse, but ecotourism hunt and hunting are, are correlated in the sense that they both depend to a large extent on global economies. And wildlife trade is driven by the value that is created uh, through the demand for wildlife by ecotourism and hunting. Landowners that undertake livestock farming in addition to wildlife ranching uh, may be faring better in the short term. Many reserves, but private and state, depended heavily on domestic tourism during uh, the global financial crisis. And there is a hope that domestic tourism can play a similar role here, at least in the medium term. And there is also some evidence to suggest that trophy hunters are less risk averse than ecotourists particularly uh, to, to political instability. And so perhaps they will travel again sooner 
uh, the revenues generated by, per hunter are also usually greater than per ecotourist. So you need a uh, few of them to travel. That said, the, the global pandemic and the impetus that it is giving to calls to ban wildlife trade may in turn give more energy to ongoing calls to ban trophy hunting as a possible knock on effect on the wildlife economy and the livelihoods that depend on it. So we sit with a severe short to medium term shock requiring financial support to keep vulnerable reserves operational and their staff employed. In the absence of that, we also risk an animal welfare and conservation crisis in terms of what happens to the wildlife on uh, reserves that collapse or transition to a different land use. And we also sit with losses to livelihoods across the board, meaning food insecurity and thus increased poaching. And inability to protect, protect wildlife in the short term amidst less money and more pressure will have impacts for the capacity to offer an attractive tourism product in the longer term. And as a concluding point, uh, resilience is not only about recovering uh, from a shock or adapting to it, it's also about transforming. And we now sit with the question of whether tourism is the answer to Southern African conservation, which has largely been the accepted discourse of recent decades. And I think we, we don't want to throw the baby out with the bathwater here, but it is time to start thinking of additional ways to support the livelihoods of people that are actually acting as the stewards of wildlife that we all care about. So I'm gonna leave it there for now. Back to you, Nadia. Thanks so much for those uh, reflections, Hayley. It's, it feels very strange. Normally we can kind of connect on some of these issues and I've got so many questions and we can normally do that in our journey up to work together. Um, but I'll, I'll save the conversation for later and give other people a chance to speak. Um, but um, yeah, passing, passing the baton on to you, Steve, um, to maybe reflect on some of the work that you've been involved with over the years as well. Great, um, thank you very much. Um, Nadia, and thank you to CST for organizing this. Um, so <clears throat> what I'm going to try and do, as uh, Haley said, I'm going to try to focus a bit more on this, uh, Southern Africa. Um, and uh, so there, as you can see on the screen, are the two organizations that I'm part of. Um, and we are having to confront this issue going forward. A few months ago, we never thought we'd be in the situation. We were building um, a whole model and our theory of change around enabling ecotourism as the main benefit from biodiversity that we could see, uh, that or their communities could see. So, um, let me just... so um, there's a picture of the protected areas in, in Africa. Um, you'll see there's a large pieces of land in Southern Africa that have been set aside. Um, and, you know, maps don't come without politics. So in, in many ways, if you look uh, at those green patches, they also, from what I, I've come to understand, also represent uh, a, a history of colonial exclusion um, of the majority of people, of indigenous people from those areas, um, and the erosion of rights and livelihoods that people had. Um, one of the big differences, Ali and I were talking about the other day between the South Africa and the rest is that South Africa has fences. Um, there, are, there are people in those parks in Angola that don't even know they're in a national park. Um, and uh, yet, uh, there, we talk about these as protected areas. In many ways, you've got to ask, what are they, what are they protecting and who are they protecting uh, the, the, the wildlife from? But uh, that be it, that as it may, clearly this is a huge asset and the globe sees these protected areas as assets. And this is what it's for. This is the Makuleke area. Uh, the Levuvu River in, in northern Kruger, Makuleke got their land back in, 19, in the late 1980s. They've developed ecotourism as the main model uh, for their benefit to the community that, that used to live there before they were moved out of the park forcibly in 1976. Um, and really this, uh, this uh, diagram just tries to explain the way the our, uh, when I say our, I suppose, I'm part of a community of practice that involves academics, it involves uh, government officials, it involves 
the conservationists, development workers, the kind of picture as we've seen it up to now in terms of what is the benefit flow? You would have your protected area where you would obviously are limited in terms of the kind of activities you could you could undertake. It was quite interesting if you have a look at the Makuleke settlement agreement. It isn't just the minister of, uh, of then it was land affairs, Derek Hanakorma and the community signing. It was the minister of mineral and energy affairs, agriculture, etc. to say they would not do those activities on the land. So you are excluding those those opportunities. Um, so there you would have in green your, your lodge um, and it would try to create jobs just outside, perhaps next to the, the fence in the B section, the community has set aside some land for some wildlife, a bit of a buffer zone. And then in the community itself, um, where um, I think uh, typically very few people would see some attachment to the land that they've been excluded from. Um, and um, as much as we try and promote agribusinesses to try and supply the lodges, we haven't had much success, I must uh, must confess, um, in, in this. And we can talk about that maybe later in the, um, um, in the question and answer. Um, this is the fever tree forest at, uh, up at Makuleke as well. The 26,000 hectares contains 80% of the biodiversity of the whole Kruger Park. Very valuable piece of land. It also sits on the border of Zimbabwe and Mozambique and is at the, what we call the heart of the transfrontier conservation area. Um, this is um, sort of how uh, I see the, the ecosystem of, of players and actors within uh, the model that we've been, we've been building up to now. You would have um, your three main people that are at the table. And why rights are so important is because it gives the community the right to sit at the table. Otherwise, the discussion really is between the private sector and the state uh, operator or the private sector and another private sector operator. Um, and what you really need, you need all three of these um, stakeholders, the, the state, being the, like sand parks or a NAC in Mozambique, um, to create an enabling envir environment for the business to take place, to, to really uh, try to find ways to help the business succeed. Um, and then you also need the private sector to be honest. Um, it's not a, a given, I can assure you. Um, and right now, when a lot of private sector operators are in trouble, um, they, they do the, the most terrible things in terms of lying to the community about revenues and all those kinds of stuff. And then you need the community to um, play a role in terms of um, uh, the way they spread the benefits. So that can be from the way jobs are allocated uh, to um, the way the lease fee that they would get for letting the private sector, or in some cases, the state use their land. Um, and they've got to play a role. And uh, I must say, I do see a very important role for NGOs, both as mediators between these three parties, as well as um, trying to keep everybody accountable. And we try in our projects create some kind of forum which brings them all together. In Southern Africa, and probably in Africa, and maybe in the world, Namibia is a leader in terms of community benefits from conservation. And they start by, first of all, um, establishing community conservancies, um, helping the institutions that are from the community uh, manage this land um, so that they can use these rights. Um, they are seen as the leader and the SADC Transfrontier Conservation Area Network have seen that model as a community engagement model, model being the, really the best. And I think it starts with the, the rights basis, first of all. Um, I, I, said, I wasn't gonna talk about South Africa a lot, but when I was preparing this, it strikes me that South Africa, as much as we have great policies, and we've got this uh, wonderful people in parks toolkit that was, that was developed. I saw Christopher Bricius is on the line. You might remember this over here. Uh, I don't know if you can see this. These were the guidelines for community-based natural resource management developed in early 2000s. Um, on the, uh, given that, which really talks about giving ownership uh, to communities, they made a decision in the Kruger Park uh, not to allow ownership of land in the Kruger Park. And um, some communities have accepted this, some have not. And uh, the Makahani, who are the descendants of Tula Mela, lived there for 500 years. They are taking government to court now to challenge the, this decision. And I think it's a mistake because um, the one thing we should be giving communities is a sense of equity and ownership, um, especially if they're prepared to leave that land under conservation. 
Um, and if, if they can do this, we should be in, enabling this kind of good environmental stewardship rather than um, not taking away the, the option for them. Um, so um, this is something I think in the next few years, uh, we'll, we'll have to watch and see how, how it goes. Um, this is a community owned lodge in uh, Namibia, a place called Kroetburg. Um, it's really, uh, and why I'm showing these pictures is I want to encourage you to go and visit these. These are community lodges that we've supported. Please, if you, when, you, when, you, when we're able to cross borders and we're able to travel in the country, go visit these, these places. The communities could do uh, with your assistance. Here are some um, figures that we used to talk about. Um, we are working as the African Safari Foundation with the Benghazi Lodge. Um, and this is our justification for supporting this. In 2016, South Africa received 10 million tourists. Um, by 2020, which is now, we would have been ranked amongst the top 20 destinations um, with 15 million. Um, 1.1 million South Africans are employed in the sector. It generated 194 billion uh, in uh, 2009, 499 billion. So this is obviously now we can't move. I don't think anybody foresaw this coming. We never imagined a world where somebody said you can't leave the country if you've got a passport or if you don't have a passport or you can't come to our country. Um, so this is going to be a huge challenge for South Africa, even more so for other countries that rely much more on tourism for uh, foreign uh, earnings, and it makes up a much greater portion of the gross domestic product than it does in South Africa. So we are facing a real challenge. This is the Shemokane Anvil Bay Lodge in Mozambique, Maputo Special Reserve. The government gave the community a concession. They unleased it to uh, the Bell Foundation, and they built an incredible lodge on the beach. Um, go visit it. Um, I'm going to refer, someone asked in the chat box whether Anna Spensley was on this um, call. Anna is a, a well-known researcher in the tourism sector. She isn't, but she kindly sent me research that's very hot off the press. It was really done a few weeks ago. Um, we, uh, they, they surveyed tourism operators and asked them what is the impact uh, of COVID. This is a EU and IUCN sponsored uh, survey. Um, there were over a thousand responses. Uh, most of them, as you can see, were from Africa. And the key thing that struck me is, let's have, if you have a look at, people say, well, who are the tourists that are going to come in future? Nearly 80% of all those tourists were international. I would say of that 80%, a good 20% were people that were pensioners. Those are exactly the people that are not going to want to travel in future. So what does it mean going forward for the tourism markets and what you're trying to, uh, who are you appealing to? Um, when they were asked, when do they think that this will um, calm down? The kind of general feeling was there's going to be a year where they're going to be emergency situations. Then there'll be issues of stabilization. Take another two years to recover. Then maybe after year five, one can talk about growth. So we're not talking about a short-term problem here at all. Um, there's going to be issues like, for example, I was thinking about the other day about, about air flights. Tourism in some of these areas can only work where you want access. Um, if companies like, like Airlink don't uh, survive, that means I don't know what's going to happen with all the tourism around Hoodspread. Um, everybody's going to have to rethink about how they actually get the tourists to, to these facilities. Um, we're in for a troubled time. Um, I know a lot of tourist operators, the ones we've been speaking to, are saying that they are trying their best not to lay off workers. But um, when you asked uh, how many have been made redundant, only 75% um, said 13% of their staff had. But if you have a look at the reality is that nearly 100% said that they had um, reduced their salaries and wages. So they really are keeping people on board. The honest ones that have paid UIF are claiming the assistance to try and keep those workers in. Um, on the payroll. This is the Buffalo Ridge um, a Lodge in Madikwe, another community-owned lodge which has got a private operator running it. So if we built, and it's, it's not just um, benefits to the communities, it's our conservation funding. Um, Haley's comments were, uh, I, I took a note of them, 2.2 billion to Sand Park from tourism and only 0.7 from the state. Who's going to pay for conservation? 
um, if we, we've been relying on tourism to do this up to now. Um, so maybe Nadia, with your permission, if I could go on a bit into some possibilities um, going forward. Um, there's a another Kruipburg Lodge, I love that place. Um, so I, I really think we have to take a more holistic and integrated, uh, we need a benefit system which is more holistic and integrated. Um, first of all, I think it starts with the concept of environmental justice, and we need to recognize that protected areas have been created uh, really on, on, the, on the back and to the, the prejudice of communities that were living in these areas. Um, the Kruger Park was established when um, the, the white population then realized they nearly shot out every animal and then we needed to protect them. And that's how it was created. Um, so, um, and then people were excluded as the protected areas were extended. Um, I think we need to understand that these are landscapes which produce water. Um, our work in the Okavango Basin really shows that if, if you destroy the upper highlands of in Angola, then that whole water system will be um, prejudiced and we, we can't allow that. Um, pollination, um, there are values which communities associate with, with those areas. Um, when I talk to the Makahani about why they want their land back in the Kruger Park, they say the blood of our ancestors is there. That to them is so valuable. Um, so I think, I, I don't know how one puts a monetary value to something like that, but one should consider that. Um, um, our communities that we've supported have got equity in the tourism ventures. And uh, once again, it goes to environmental justice. I think going forward, globally, we need to convince uh, the West that there is value in having these air protected areas. I mean, even COVID says now the wildlife needs space to just exist without too much human interference. And how do how can we fund that? We can fund it through carbon finance. Um, if communities are keeping their land aside, if they are rehabilitating land, they're doing environmental jobs like taking out alien vegetation. Um, that should be part of the funding that goes into those areas. And that funding should go to the communities that are foregoing other development opportunities. Because that's really what it is. It's a, it's a choice. Um, and it's a choice being made for the global good, for the national good, and that should be rewarded. The Makuleke model was that they had to earn all their money from tourism revenue, percentage of turnover. My view, that is not enough. They should be paid a lease fee by the government for keeping their land inside the Kruger Park as well, over and above what they are, uh, they are doing. I don't know where the government's going to get that money now, but maybe it comes from these other mixed finance models. Um, I think it's critical that once tourism picks up again, that there is a fairer trade arrangement. Um, there are some very um, wealthy individuals that have made their money off the ecotourism sector, and the, they have not included communities in, in the business model going forward. Uh, wages are not enough. Um, I was reading this morning, 56 people in Ngami land in uh, Botswana were killed by elephants last year. Um, and that's mostly women and children going to get water. So um, how does one compensate for that? You can't exclude people. If you're going to say we're going to, we want the wildlife for, for tourism, uh, for biodiversity, then we've got to find ways that we manage those risks. Um, and uh, Haley talked about, uh, about hunting. I do believe hunting is um, an important source of revenue. Um, and I think I'm, I'm picking up what I'm hearing is there is poaching taking place right now. Ooh. Have you muted me? No, no, no. Okay. Um, I'm about to finish. Um, so um, I think what I'm, uh, the last two things I want to pick up on is ultimately protected areas are one land use and they should be part of a, a rural development program, but they will never meet all the development needs. Um, we can't have the Africa Foundation from and beyond fixing up water points, feeding people, sand parks going and delivering food parcels. That's not their job. It's other government departments that should be doing that. Um, I think we can start using some digital tools to transfer uh, money to communities. Um, and in Namibia, they've trialed that and it does work. You can do that now. So you don't have to go through these intermediaries that are costing a lot of money uh, before communities benefit. 
Um, and there are, like, there is a community of practice and the SADC Transfrontier Conservation Network is an example of that where people are talking continually about trying to address these problems. And that is a resource. Um, and this picture for me really uh, it captures it because it says, this is what we should be looking at holistically. E e Ecotourism, we put all our eggs in one basket. That basket has now dropped. Now we're in trouble. It's because we don't have this holistic approach to things. And if we could do this, we'll build resilience it's got that diversity component um, and we can spread the benefits. Thank you very much. Thanks so much, Steve, um, for already uh, answering one of the questions that I was going to, to pose to both of you. But maybe, um, yeah, uh, over to you, Haley, to, to think about what opportunities can you see or for transformation that you might see emerging in, in some of the communities of practice that you, you've been working in? Sure, thanks uh, for, for a really interesting uh, presentation there, Steve. And I completely agree with uh, a lot of what you laid out in, on the last page. We can't have everything in one basket or in you know, baskets that are quite uh, linked together. So, so I agree, uh, particularly in terms of payments for ecosystem services, carbon you know, markets, things like that to think about. I do also um, agree in terms of sustainable use. You know, in South Africa, we see that very much in the private sector. Um, I see there was a question there by, by Mike Peel in, in terms of, you know, trophy hunting across the board. Uh, our national parks and or our state parks at the moment don't do trophy hunting, but in some ways they benefit uh, through wildlife trade with um, with private reserves. And, and that's still low, but I think, you know, there's potential for that to grow in some parks uh, like Makala, for example, are increasingly uh, involved in that. And, and in terms of transformation, I also think, um, well, firstly, I think a, a point that's important is that uh, uh, tourism was never a panacea anyway. Um, it's expensive to start tourism operations. There, you know, tourists are fussy. Um, there's a lot more land that needs to be conserved than there are tourists uh, willing to go to these, you know, these far, far away places. Um, so, so I think this is a conversation that we actually needed to have anyway. And I think also in South Africa, there's in particular, I see there's kind of this danger of a dichotomy between if you're doing wildlife, then you're doing conservation. And if you're doing anything else, then you're not. And I think that, you know, I mentioned that some, some landowners do mixed land use, uh, wildlife as well as livestock. There's a lot of land and livestock in South Africa that uh, can be well managed and, and in that way contribute to conservation uh, of many elements of the ecosystem, maybe not the megafauna, but but other elements. So I think, you know, th this is a this is a gradient and, and we need to, to not sit on any any of the ends of it. Awesome. Thanks, Haley. Um, and maybe just, just before we move over to the, I see lots of people are posing questions in the Q&A, which is fantastic. Um, but just have there been any, any surprises where you had expected when this thing started, we started realizing that there was going to be a lockdown? Have you been surprised by anything? Something has happened, um, yeah, that you weren't expecting, um, and hopefully in, in positive ways. Um, so we could learn from that and, and see what the opportunities are to, to build on some of those positive changes. I've seen uh, from my side that um, organization like Sam Parks has played an important role in terms of just getting food to people. Um, I think it's a, it's a really a good approach to develop good relationships with their neighbors. Um, I hope it will be taken forward into looking at things like, for example, giving communities in Pumalanga and Limpopo free access to the Kruger Park, for example. To me, it's, it's shocking that less than 10% of those communities, of those individuals, have even gone to the Kruger Park. Um, so I think if we can establish those kind of relationships, um, and uh, it, it, it's good. Um, so that, so that, has been a, that has been a pleasant surprise, um, because I'm sure uh, otherwise it's very easy to fall back into a kind of fortress mentality of now we're going to have so many hungry people, let's, um, let's take a militaristic approach. I don't think that's the answer. So hopefully this will be a sign of things. 
maybe I can, I can, I think that's an interesting question. And um, to take a bit of a step back, I mentioned at the beginning that I have this new research project that's basically trying to, to measure ecosystem condition and then explore how that links with human well-being, which of course we know it does in many ways. And I think, you know, this pandemic is an awful example of what we've been talking about in theory that we're now seeing in practice in terms of when those relationships between people and ecosystems are unhealthy. And, you know, really what we're talking about here when we talk about the wildlife economy in many ways is, is healthy ecosystems in ways that, you know, they are sustained. And, and so I hope that people are making those linkages and, and that it's kind of reinforcing the need uh, uh, for conservation areas and in ways that are, are sustainable and fair to the people that live around them as well, because they are the stewards of our intact ecosystems. Super, thanks. Um, I think we'll move over to the, the Q&A that people have, have been posing. And I guess this, you know, the first question that Paul raised is, is linked to a broader, you know, both of you mentioned that we should have been changing the system already, um, but now we have an opportunity to maybe think about what those changes might, might and could look like. Um, and, and Paul's question was, why, why has it been so difficult um, to vest the rights to resources with communities um, that, that host those resources? Um, not just in South Africa, but in kind of the whole region. I'm not sure if either of you would like to to tackle that question. I can start. I think um, I mentioned Namibia as a, a, a case, um, but it's also a, as a good case. It's also a good case because it has very few people. So um, relative to some other areas. So the ability for a smaller community to benefit from a, a large, which can employ nearly somebody from every family is very different compared to other areas. I think um, there has, I think, um, okay, how do I word this? Conservation officials in general are conservative. And by that, I mean they are, are generally um, anti-development. And so if you're trying to maximize a benefit and a return from those resources, they are normally the ones that would try and stand in your way. So for example, where we've tried to have bicycle trips or fishing in the in the Kruger Park with the Makuleke, the conservation officials have been against that, um, although we, we're just trying to maximize the return. So I think there's been a hesitance to actually really devolve power and responsibility um, by the by state to, to those communities because they don't, they don't trust the community will manage those resources well. Um, I think part of the answer to that is putting in place systems where the state is supporting and NGOs are supporting the communities to make good decisions in, the, in those places. Um, rather than being the gatekeeper. Um, and, and, and I think that's generally a default, unfortunately, of the state in general, is they try and control things. So I think, I don't think the problems with the community, I think it's been more from the people that have the, the rights right now, not wanting to devolve rights uh, down. Um, so I think that would be my answer to Paul's question. Cool. Um, I think, yeah, there's some other questions that have come up that are specifically, yeah, directed at some of the, the comments that you made, Heidi, around, um, yeah, private wildlife reserves generating more employment um, and comparisons that maybe, yeah, other people have found some differences there um, and whether or not you, you could comment on that from, from what you've seen. Yeah, sure. I see that that's a comment from Maria. And hi, Maria. Uh, thanks for joining us. And um, yes, absolutely. The so, so firstly, just to clarify that the research uh, that I mentioned around jobs uh, on wildlife ranches, so private reserves versus on farms, um, is not my research. It comes out of a paper that was recently published uh, by Andrew Taylor and colleagues uh, in biological conservation, where they did a national survey of wildlife ranches, and then they tried to get comparable stats um, for, for the livestock industry, which proved to be challenging uh, to, to compare uh, uh, employment numbers uh, across both. And I agree with you that really the 
the wildlife uh, players that that generate the most uh, employment are, are definitely the eco high-end ecotourism operations. I see that certainly out of my work as well. Um, but I also I think it's a, it's a good point of yours that you know conversions to to some hunting reserves and other enterprises that rely on live sales may in fact result in uh, job losses uh, compared to to live stock and and I think the the challenge with this is also is that many uh, landowners moved from one to the other from livestock to uh, eco or ecotourism or hunting because it was just a more viable land use so there's a, qu a question of viability in there as well um, but certainly it's not transparent uh, you know it's not clear cut. Uh, the one versus the other, absolutely. And and then you're up to your other point in terms of conservation issues uh, with private wildlife reserves. I, I mentioned earlier that, you know, I don't think we should see everything that has wildlife as good for conservation and everything that doesn't have wildlife as bad for conservation, as they are livestock farms that are good for conservation. There is also increasing intensification uh, on private wildlife ranches, some of them, which is related to many more uh, fences, uh, and increasing densities of, of certain high uh, value wildlife. So there's there's a conversation that's been having had at the moment in the wildlife sector in terms of a certification scheme to kind of differentiate uh, where reserves sit on that. But absolutely, it's important again that this is not a black and white issue uh, in terms of you know what contributes to conservation in what way. Um, and, and trying to group a couple of um, questions that came through. Um, a few people have raised questions around how to improve benefit flows um, from 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 wildlife, um, and how and whether or not you've got any suggestions on how this could be done, or you've got some examples. Also, some of the problematic um, elements linked to concepts like payment for ecosystem services. Um, yeah, so if you could reflect on that and whether whether you know of of some examples where where, where um, some initiatives have have improved um, kind of how people benefit from from wildlife adjacent to where they live, or or yeah, the parks no, that I they think, actually. Um, yeah, own. I mean, um, I think the the wildlife economy um, has some very ambitious goals about trying to. I think the statistics mentioned by Haley in terms of private land versus state land, when they looked at that, they also saw that private landowners are managing to do uh, culling, biltong, uh, skin production, etc. So I think there's, there's ways in which one can um, broaden the benefits and the kind of revenue streams that come, come off a piece of well-maintained biodiverse area. And once animals are fenced in, eventually uh, they're going to, they're going to be too many of them. So I think we should do that and we should be looking at community land that uh, where people can produce, perhaps if one house, every household in a village got a, a springbok a year, that would go a long way in, in showing that there's some value to the, to, to that piece of land. Um, certainly, I agree with with Kevin in terms of payment for ecosystem services. Who's making the payment is a is an issue. So we really, I think, need to be exploring different models. Um, I think there is quite a lot of um, philanthropic money which is available to preserve these areas and we look at what the Car Foundation has done in uh, in uh, Mozambique, um, Patagonia has done in some other parts of Chile, they put money into trying to conserve those areas and I think if we can find ways that those monies could go into in a way that it can generate more money and that money could go to communities right to the household, I think that's what I would like to get to. A situation where it's not going through a communal property association or through a trust but it is going to every household that they get their annual payment. And in Namibia, there have been experiments with that. And for example, using satellites to see if whether there's been an incursion into a migration zone or not. And if there hasn't, then it triggers an automatic payment to those villages. Uh, I think there are ways we, we can do it and we've just got to be creative and use the, the new digital technology to allow that to, to happen, to facilitate that. Um, 
There were also some questions around trophy hunting. I know that's quite, uh, and, and Hayley, that's, that's a topic that you're going to be digging into um, with your new funding that you've got. Um, and, and it seems to kind of, people are either very much for it or against it. Um, not many people are kind of sitting on the fence. Um, and just, and each of the, the countries have got different regulations and rules around how they manage trophy hunting. And, and do you foresee some of, you know, do you foresee changes happening uh, now that uh, we have to kind of rethink models around um, how people benefit from wildlife economies? Um, and do you think, yeah, not to kind of force you to take a stand on it, but what are some of the, the interesting um, aspects that are linked to that, especially as it relates to, to trying to make um, the benefits flow to communities and how those resources are allocated? Yeah, so so great question, and I haven't done this research yet. I will be doing it over the next several years, but I think it's it is definitely topical right now, and it's topical because there are these growing global uh, pressures to ban trophy hunting, which the arguments for that are that it's unethical, um, and and also there's an argument that uh, the benefits that are claimed to flow to to local communities don't. And so I think, you know, what is interesting for me going forward is to, to rather than taking this black and white perspective is to try and get an understanding of, you know, where it works and why, and if there are lessons that can be learned from that. And I think, you know, given the pandemic uh, and the potential impact that it's, well, the, the potential longer term impact that it's going to have on ecotourism, um, I think these are conversations we need to have. I mentioned uh, already that ecotourism requires many more people uh, to generate revenues, uh, typically compared to, to trophy hunting. There are also examples uh, of very high-end ecotourism that requires fewer people. Those are also good to look into, but they typically uh, require much bigger investments. Um, and then I, I also watch the space with interest. As I mentioned, there is this kind of growing movement against trophy hunting, and that I think, you know, there's a chance that that's going to get kind of caught up with this uh, discussion around wildlife trade uh, and use in general, uh, which is very closely linked to the pandemic. Um, and so, so I, you know, I think there's potentially a growing need to think about the role of trophy hunting, but there's also, I think, a growing pressure to, to, for it to, to go away. So, so I watch the space uh, with interest in coming years. Nadia, I'll just add one quick thing, and that is, I know the Great Limpopo TFCA is looking at a, an, an approach that basically puts in place regulations across the across boundaries borders. So you don't have a situation where uh, a, a, a very big Tusker elephant is shot in Zimbabwe, maybe comes from the Kruger Park, etc. So trying to put those regulations in place uh, is part of the answer. Um, and uh, I, I do foresee trophy hunting as as part of the solution. Um, where it is possible and where you don't have tourism that it, that, that it impacts on. And there's going to be a while before tourism picks up again. So it's, it's, it's important to consider. Okay. Fantastic. Um, I see that we've just gone on to uh, two o'clock. Um, and I think there are many more questions than we have time for, for answers. But it's been phenomenal. I think they're now... Yeah, kind of 26 questions that have been posed um, in the in the Q&A box. Uh, some of them have been answered. We haven't had time to get to all of them. But what we can do is I'll make sure that we copy all of these questions. Some of the comments that were also put in the chat group. Um, I think this sounds like it's a, it's a very vibrant space for continuing some of these discussions. Um, as I said earlier, this, this has been recorded. Um, but we've also got each other's kind of contact details to, to continue in the space. Um, so I'd just like to take this opportunity to say thank you so much, Hayley and Steve. This has been, this has been really great. I've learned a huge amount. Um, and it's been wonderful to have um, this kind of platform to have these discussions, um, especially as, as things unfold um, and as countries start lifting lockdown bans and trying to reimagine what this space could look like in the future. Um, just in terms of discussions going forward, we've got another seminar slot next week. Um, at the same time, and there we again are linking to some of the discussions that are happening within the Resilient Waters project. We've got um, a session that's planned with um, uh, the uh, Kule uh, 
Chetepa from Resilient Waters, along with um, Dion Nell from the Global Resilience Partnership um, with uh, Unsi Biggs, who will be moderating that discussion. And there the conversation will really focus on practi uh, practical resilience building strategies in the region. Um, so both of, uh, all three of them to kind of reflect on that um, in the light of these big shocks like we're seeing at the moment with, with the corona pandemic. So thank you again, everybody. This has been this has been really, really great. I see we've still got many people that are still logged on, which is fantastic. Um, and yeah, please join us next week. Um, and also, if you'd like to be a guest on one of these webinars, please also get in touch um, with, with those details and pose some interesting questions that we can debate on this platform. So thank you very much. Thanks very much. Thank you. Go well, everybody.